glad you're here this morning. Would you stand with us right now? Let's sing this song together, whether you're online or in person. I know God wants to hear your voice and praise his name. So let's sing this together. Make sure he is glorified today. Joy to you. mentioned it several times this season, what well are you drawing from? And we have to draw from his well in order to have that joy, not just during the Advent season, but daily. Amen? Throughout this entire season, God has been using traditional Christmas carols to speak to me in a fresh new way. And one of our carols today is no different. Written in the 1700s was a poem that was to be recited on Christmas Day. It's a song that we have sang more times than you can count, but have you ever really listened to it? Hark the Herald. While it is a traditional Christmas song, it also tells the gospel. The angels came and they declared the good news. They start out by saying, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God, this newborn king. Hail him. God came, he sent his son Jesus to bring us life, to bring us light, to bring peace and hope, to heal us. And because of his rich mercy, he came that man no more may die. Today we sing of the good news 
the good news of the reason why he came. And we thank him for this life. Amen. Let's worship. We join with the angels and we say glory to you.
For those of you with us online today, we hope that you'll take a second right now and get a cracker or a piece of bread and juice or something like juice so that you can join together with us in this communion experience. I think it's important to remind ourselves that a communion is really Christmas. When we think about the fact that the Son of God came and entered the world first lying in a wooden cattle feeding trough and ultimately changing, exchanging the wood of the manger for the wood of a cross. It was there that ultimately his plan, God's plan for our redemption, our forgiveness was fulfilled. This, this baby that we celebrate at Christmas became a man who would take the punishment for our sins upon himself. And so he gave us a way to remember that. And for thousands of years now, followers of Jesus have celebrated his death on a cross because it ultimately led to a resurrection and ultimately leads to your resurrection if you believe. And so if you'll open the small side of your cup and pull out the bread, on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread after giving thanks, he broke it. He said to his disciples, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat it. Do this in remembrance of me. As you eat the bread, remember his broken body for the forgiveness of your sins. And a little while later, in that Passover meal with his disciples, he took a cup. He raised it up to them and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Take and drink it. Do this in remembrance of me. As you drink the cup, remember his blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, here we are today just in the midst of a world of struggle, celebrating something. First, celebrating that you loved us so much that you came to the world, that you gave us your life for ours. And then we think of fast-forwarding to the end of your earthly life and how you took our punishment on that cross and yet rose from the dead, giving us hope and life, and today we remember. Thank you for your broken body, for your shed blood, for showing us that the end of Christmas is our salvation. And so we receive that gift today. We put our faith in you and, and ask you to wash us with your word and with your spirit. Cleanse us from all that you had to come to the world to solve and empower us to live our lives as a gift to the Christ child. Jesus, we know in this room today, with us online today, are people who are suffering, people who are confused, people who live in the midst of difficulty, and we find you there to help. You are our hope. And so today, thank you. Thank you for this reminder of your love. Thank you for your spirit speaking to us and your word that cleanses us. And we give ourselves to you today in worship for your glory and your wonderful name. Amen. Stand with us. We want to continue our time of worship. You may stand with us, I'm sorry. Continue our time of worship as we reflect what it really meant for the King of Heaven to come and be with us and why that's so important. Children weep no more, hope is on the horizon.
the dawn of salvation. Darkness reigns no more, for Jesus is great. Consider your life peaceful right now? No, not at all. <laughs> Could you say that your life is peaceful? In today's age, I think it's very difficult to force anyone to find peace. Would you consider your life peaceful? No. <laughs> job, the job is really stressful, so overall, no, but uh, I try to do what I can to get by. So. Where do you find peace? Where do I find peace? In the trees. How so? Those are living, breathing, eating creatures. I think they're awesome. Okay. Um, where does peace come from? Well, to some degree internal, realizing that we have all the same powers and uh, amazing entities that trees and nature has. Tell me three things that worry you. Um, when the world is going to end, what I'm going to be doing in the next few years. Who am I marry? I think that worries me. Okay. Where does peace come from? Uh, inside, I think. For me, the ocean, because it's a place that I um, connect with myself, just in the how big it is and how, like, I don't know, permanent. Where does peace come from? Uh, peace comes from being totally happy with yourself and your decisions. Um, you can't totally be happy if you have questions in your mind, and that's where I think total peace comes from. Where does peace come from? Within, in the heart, from love, from friends and family. And basically, that's where I find peace. 
Would you consider your life peaceful right now? No. Um, because there's too much killing and violence and stuff going around. I mean, you couldn't even, like, like back in the old days, you can leave your door open and, you know, people wouldn't say too much or nothing. Um, um, people kidnapping and stuff, so I don't, I don't think it's peaceful. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You're Name three things that worry you. Um, I'd have to say also STDs, um, flunking out of school, and going to heaven. Going to heaven worries you? It, well, what worries me is not going there. <laughs> so where do you find peace? At home, on my couch, watching sports, baseball, football, that sort of stuff. Where does peace come from? Peace comes from relaxation, friends, family. Would you consider your life peaceful right now? Very. Have a good weekend. Thank you, you too. Where does peace come from? I can't, it comes from inside. Where do you think peace comes from? Uh, with them. Where does peace come from? I think you have to make your own peace. Where does peace come from? Uh, inside, I think. Where does peace come from? With him. Where do you think peace comes from? Where do I think that? Oh, I know where peace comes from. Okay. <laughs> I know. I mean, um, I think the Bible teaches it best, you know. Jesus said something. He said, the peace I give, not like the world gives, you know. And I think it's found in the book of John. So the peace that people really need, which I think is the lasting peace, comes from knowing God. Not just God, but having a connection with faith in Christ Jesus. And uh, I think that's what many people miss. I found that. And I think it works. Um, I've lived that life for some years now. And I think it's a true word that Jesus spoke. So that's where peace comes from. Hey, I've got great news. Those are five words that people love to hear. I've got great news. I'm counting the contraction there as five words. Now, see, isn't that, isn't that a great phrase when you're, you're always on the end of your seat then or you're ready to listen because you're like, hey, I need some great news in my life. I, I love looking at the old black and white footage of cities in America after wars have ended and the celebration and the euphoria goes on when peace treaties are signed and how excited everybody gets. Um, I love how excited a lot of people are that a vaccine is out there now that could protect us from a pandemic. I love it, love it, that the Buckeyes are Big Ten champions of, yeah, three of us here think that that's good news. You know, it's interesting when, you, when we talk about that, what, what is good news to us might not be good news to somebody else. But in, if you'll notice in all instances, the fact is that bad news was either ended, solved, or avoided when someone tells the story of good news, whatever that news is. And that's really what our series has been all about. It's, it's what the prophets had been telling the people for generations, for hundreds of years. There's a lot of bad news out there, but here's the good news. Someone's coming who's going to change all of that. And Christmas was the culmination of that promise where he came to put an end to bad news and give us good news. So you look at the prophet Isaiah's message, which we've been unpacking here the last few weeks, and he says, look, you're going to continue to live in oppression by the Assyrians. That's bad news. He said, look, you're going to continue to suffer in your life. That's bad news. But he says, look, you're going to be delivered and find freedom because you repent of your sin. That's good news. He says, a Messiah is coming to rescue you. Good news. It's the good news that puts an end to the bad news, and that's why we call it good. Christmas is the good news to end, solve, and avoid the bad news of sin, pain, and death. Now, all you have to do is open your news feed, and you can see that there's a boatload of sin, pain, and death going on in the world today. 
And yet the message of Isaiah and the prophets remains for us. Now, let me just give you a couple examples from the Christmas story, uh, from the angels themselves. First, an angel appears to Joseph, and he says, your wife Mary will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. He brought good news. And the angels to the shepherd, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Now, in both cases, good news ended bad news. There is a satisfying, soulful response to the news sung by the angel choir that we often reference and we did in our singing this morning. Um, If you go to Luke chapter 2, verse 13, here's again what the angel choir says to the shepherds. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God. Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to all whom God favors. Now you see, it's another aspect of good news that we've been talking about the last few weeks. That big word there, peace. Peace. I mean, if we're all honest, it's the word that we just love to experience in our life where we feel all of the stresses and anxieties and worries of our, our daily existence kind of melt away and we can breathe this great sigh. And today, I, I want to bring you a few concepts of peace that I hope are encouraging to you as you celebrate Christmas this year. And the first one is this, good news brings peace to your heart, to your heart. Now, I was, I was really intrigued when I listen to people interview or when they're asked, where, do pe- where does peace come from? And so many of them say peace comes from within. I mean, does it? Can you actually yourself manufacture internal peace? I mean, is it simply a Zen moment that comes from breathing and relaxing and m- contemplation? I mean, to some extent, yes. You can experience physical calm in the midst of certain breathing exercises, calming exercises. You you absolutely can. But the problem is, when you finish breathing and relaxing and contemplating, you've got to return to the fact that there are real challenges in your life. What's going to give you peace that helps you as you walk through those challenges? Well, ultimately, can I achieve peace that doesn't dissipate? When serious difficulty rises up in my life, can I find the peace the angels sang about to the shepherds? Now, when I read the Bible, like from the 84th floor, and I see the big picture of it, there are two realities that are threads that go through the entire Bible story. First, sin in my heart creates internal stress, and sin outside of me creates external stress, internal stress and external stress in my life. Do you have it? I mean, when the angels declare Jesus will bring peace to all the people that God favors, they're talking about both aspects of stress. Like, Like, take this story here, Joseph. I mean, think about it. In his day and age, he's betrothed. Now, while that's an engagement, marries his fiance, it is legally binding as if it is a marriage. And he discovers she's pregnant. Now, if that's not hard enough, in our generation, it was exponentially difficult in their generation because of the way their culture looked at that kind of thing. Not only could she have lost her husband, but she could have actually been stoned to death in some communities. And so here's Joseph. I mean, and he's a great guy. But he can't continue with the marriage because of his faith, and yet he doesn't want Mary publicly humiliated. And so Matthew tells us this is what happened in Matthew chapter 1. You can read it. Joseph, her fiancé, being a just man, decided to break the engagement quietly so as not to disgrace her publicly. And as he considered this, he fell asleep, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to go ahead with your marriage to marry. For the child within her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. 
and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So the angel tells Joseph he can trust Mary and he can trust God. Now his, this message now puts Joseph's inner turmoil at ease because he doesn't have to base his decision moving forward with Mary on cultural expectations. He can follow through with the marriage and feel good about it because he knows it's what God wants for him. That's the big difference in what's going to give you inner peace, men and women. It's knowing that you're on the path that God has designed for you. And even more, he ultimately will see that this child that they're about to have will deliver people from their greatest source of inner stress, their own spiritual failure, their own sin. I mean, I know there's no one in this room, and I know there's no one with us online that would raise their hand and say, got no sin in my life, never sinned in my life, no need for forgiveness in my life. No, we all know that we've failed at times where God has laid it out for us, and yet we find now the object who can bring peace to that inner turmoil. You see, the good news of Christmas is that Jesus deals with both the internal and the external stressors and provides a quiet confidence that God truly has our eternity under control. You don't have to wonder if you're going to heaven. That doesn't have to be uh, something you fear. You can look forward to that day because of the peace that comes from the child. Now, it's interesting that the gospel writer John includes a comment from Jesus that specifically addresses this reality. He was preparing his followers for the most stressful moment of their lives, his arrest, his trial, and ultimately his crucifixion, and the social concern and the pressure that would be on them in that situation. And this is what Jesus says to them as he's preparing them. I am leaving you with a gift peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give isn't like the peace the world gives, so don't be troubled or afraid. You see, Jesus is promising that everyone who trusts him, that God's favor will be upon those people. And because of that, trouble and fear subside. So so go ahead, you know, take your deep breath. Go ahead and close your eyes and meditate and contemplate. Go ahead and relax. And as you do, focus your meditation on the good news that the angels promised to both Joseph and the shepherds. Receive, don't just talk about it, don't just read about it, but literally receive this peace that God's offering to you. You know, we're not all in the room today or watching online just to hear some little talk and say we went to church at Christmas time. We're here for God to do something in us. And today he offers to bring to you, you, you individually, you specifically, your heart. He offers to bring you his peace. Not a peace you got to feel like you got to manufacture, but a peace he offers you as a gift when you trust in him. And at that point, you can be prepared to realize a second form of peace. And and I want to take you actually to a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to his friends in a town called Colossae. And in chapter 3, we read this. Listen, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And and now listen, here's how he wraps up this little section. And let the peace of Christ Rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. 
Listen, that's great news when you think about it, that the God of the universe has created you to experience perfect peace in your heart. But the Apostle Paul spent a great deal of time with the disciples of Jesus who taught him all the lessons that Jesus taught. So the importance and value of personal relationships were a theme in every one of his letters that he wrote in the Bible because it was the primary application of grace in Jesus' teaching ministry. And that's why it brings us to the second kind of peace that I want you to understand happens when you embrace this good news at Christmas. That good news brings peace not only to your own heart but to your relationships, to the people that you connect with in your life. Now, when the angels declared peace on earth, they sang it in the context of proclaiming the glory of God in heaven. It was a form of worship, in other words. God not only brings peace to the world through Christ, but he brings glory to his name when peace is realized in our human relationships one-on-one. When we have a solid connection with people that he puts in our life and there aren't barriers or wedges or brokenness in that relationship. That's why the Apostle Paul made it such an important point of every letter he wrote. As he's unpacking doctrine and theology, he's constantly reminded, reminding the reader that we live out our worship in human relationships. I mean, even Jesus said it, whatever you've done to these, the least my brothers, you've done to me. So whatever it is you're saying to someone, whatever it is you're thinking toward someone, whatever action you take against someone, it's as if you're doing it to Jesus himself. How worshipful is your spirit toward that person who's offended you the most or is your worst enemy? You see, if we proclaim to have received the peace of God in our hearts by embracing his grace and forgiveness, we offer that same forgiveness to all in our life, even our greatest offender or our enemy. See, his words, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body you are called to peace, simply amplify the words of the angels, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace. That's what he's talking about. God is glorified when we are loving one another. If we truly have Jesus as the ruler of our hearts, the leader of our lives, the Lord of our existence, his grace flows through us, and we're seeking peace in every relationship. It's not a relationship where we have to be a slave to our own bitterness and anger and frustration and disappointment. Rather, he came so we could be liberated from all of that. The good news of Christmas is that peace can be restored if you will humble yourself and seek it in any and every relationship. And I, I, just, I, I read that through that, and I think of my own time in, in, in difficulty or conflict with people, and I think, wow, what a great promise that I don't have to sit around mulling how I feel towards somebody. Some angry thought I have or some kind of a bitterness I have toward them for something they've done. I can be delivered from that and offer it to them as well. You know, what what I've noticed now is when you have 8 billion channels on television, um, some of them can devote the entire Christmas season to Christmas movies. Have any of you noticed that, or am I the only one that's picking up on that? One One of the movies that I like to watch over every year is Home Alone. I love Home Alone. And, and it's pretty funny, actually. And yet it's, it, it's interesting because there's a very profound scene or two in it that's talking exactly about what the angels were talking about. Now, you may remember Kevin, the main character, has been left at home uh, accidentally by his family at Christmas. He's all by himself. And he's scared to death of his next-door neighbor, Marley, who's this old man that everybody thinks is evil and wants to eat them. And he ends up by himself in a church while a children's choir is rehearsing for a Christmas program, and there he is right across the aisle, Marley. 
And all of a sudden, he discovers he's in a conversation with him. And Marley begins to open up to Kevin and tell him that the reason he's at the rehearsal is because his son won't talk to him. He has to hear his granddaughter sing at rehearsal because he's not allowed to come to the program. And here's little Kevin. He looks at Marley and he says, you should call him. You should reach out to him. And, and Marley's response is what all of our responses are in situations like this. Oh, it won't do any good. Or he's too far gone. I, I know there's too, many, too, too much water under the bridge. I mean, we, there's no way we'll reconcile. And Kevin is sitting there in Home Alone encouraging Marley, this guy he just a few minutes before was terrified of, to reach out to his estranged son. You fast forward to the end of the movie, and on Christmas Day, Kevin's looking out the window of his house, and he sees Marley welcoming his son and his granddaughter and his his daughter-in-law. He reached out to them and was reconciled. Now, here's the thing. I don't know if the film writers knew that they were actually writing the biblical story of Christmas. Because that's what the angels promised all of us in our relationships. Peace. Peace. You see, Jesus taught in his Sermon on the Mount that if there is brokenness in your relationship with someone, take the initiative and reach out to mend it. He said, look, even if you're coming to worship and you're bringing an offering, he says, look, leave your offering on the altar and first go and try to reconcile with the person that you're having a broken relationship with. Do your part. Reach out to them. Humble yourself. And after doing that, then come and worship God. Because, you see, that's the whole point. He came to this world to bring peace to our relationship with one another. And it's in that context that we sing glory to God in the highest. And when the Savior provides you personal peace, he offers to take you to the next level and restore those broken relationships. The good news of great joy at Christmas is that you don't have to stay bitter and angry any longer. But our personal peace and peace in specific relationships means we can move from the micro application of just me individually or just me and another person to the macro application of the angel's song of peace. Look again at Luke chapter 2, verse 14, what the angels sang. Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to all whom God favors. You see, we often are so focused on our own life circumstances that we forget the magnitude of the angel announcement, peace on earth to all upon whom God favors. You see, the good news doesn't just bring peace to your heart or even peace to just your relationships, but God offers to bring peace to all humanity through this good news. Now, imagine what a different world we would be living in if everyone discovered the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. Imagine that world. And I often do. It's this, it's this dream I'll have. I'll close my eyes and just think, what would the whole world be like if they loved Jesus and received his forgiveness and began to extend it to one another? Not just in one-on-one relationships, but between communities, countries. Imagine a world like that. Now, let me remind you again about Isaiah and the other prophets, that their message was an explanation to the people that their pain and violence existed on the earth because they'd lost sight of the God who had chosen them. They had abandoned his calling on their life. They had stopped following his laws that were designed for their best interest out of love. They had no peace in their community, and they had no peace in their nation because they had no peace in their hearts in abandoning their trust of God's ways. God had chosen them to be the example to the world of what a blessed life is that's following his design. So the angels didn't limit their good news to just a young couple and a few shepherds and some eastern magi. No, they declared that limited peace could be realized 
through the Messiah that was now lying as a baby in a cattle feeding trough wrapped in swaddling cloths. And that's why we're offered the opportunity. And here it is, men and women, every one of us are offered the opportunity to pray for the peace of the world. Now, anytime we start talking about us in relationship to the world, we get a little overwhelmed. Like, really? You think that my little uh, existence and me calling up a prayer to God for the peace in the world will actually make a difference? Well, (laughs) we're offered that opportunity because God wants us to cry out to him as the solution to the violence and war and incessant hatred that's on the earth. That's why the angel said, peace on earth. Not just peace to you. Peace on earth, because the Savior has been born. Now look, there's been vitriol and hate on the earth since Cain murdered Abel in the first family. Injustice, hate, violence, and division aren't some new reality. It's always been in the human experience. We think there's more of it now, but there really isn't. It's just now that we have uh, the internet and social media, we can watch it nonstop. You know, and, and you know why it's on there nonstop? Because we're watching it. We watch it, they show it, we watch it, they show it, and we just keep feeding our minds and our spirits a daily dose, a nonstop dose of violence, pain, and suffering. And then we say, well, there's more of it than there ever has been in history. No, there isn't. It's just that we see it more often. See, we, the followers of Jesus and the celebrators of the good news of Christmas, we have the right message, the message of the angelic choir. And here it is. We need to join the angels and bring the good news of peace to this violent world rather than joining in the divisive arguments that ultimately will not solve anything. I mean, all of these limited opportunities that we have to actually speak to someone or post something, we have this great opportunity to declare peace on earth. The Lord Jesus offers this opportunity to reconcile our relationships, and yet we waste our time on divisive arguments. And I get it. Not everyone's going to embrace this message. Jesus himself said that not everyone would embrace the message. But rather than trying to win a political argument, we should be fighting our spiritual enemy with the power of prayer, faith, compassion, justice, and hope. We should be fighting our common spiritual enemy with the good news of Christmas. See, if the angels of God, who could wipe out an entire city with fire from heaven if they wanted to, spoke peace to the world through the innocence of a baby in a manger, maybe we should too. What if the good news of peace started with me? I mean, what if I paused and recognized that I've been chasing hard after peace through a lot of things that have nothing to do with God's plan for my life? What if I openly and honestly confessed that to him and said, forgive me? What if I took the initiative to reconcile the broken relationships in my life? What if I chose to join the angels and focused my public statements on the love and grace of the Savior of Christmas And I prayed every day for the peace of the world. Well, that's what the angel's message announced to the shepherds and to the world is all about. Peace, men and women, is already here. If we'll just embrace it, ask for it, receive it, and share it with the people around us. Not worried about what kind of response we'll get. Rather, just knowing that it is God's answer to all that ails the world. It is the good news to answer the bad news that we live among all day long. And so I think what's 
my response to all of this. It's a prayer. Lord, bring peace to my spirit where I have allowed sin and fear and worry and anger to live in me. And show me who I need to reach out to for healing in our relationship. And give me words to speak to my generation that will point people to Jesus and his good news of peace. Merry Christmas. Peace has come. The question is, will you receive it for yourself? Men and women, I just want you to know you can. And that's good news. Would you bow your heads with me? Right now, in this moment, I want you to pray your own prayer in response to what you've heard. Just call out to God in your heart. Lord Jesus, you know the anxiety, the worry, the stress that I've been feeling. Pour your peace into me. Heal my heart and heal my relationships. Bring peace to this world. You pray your own prayer that needs to be offered up to God for your life. Jesus, thank you so much for this tremendous gift of peace. Even now, as we pray, we sense your spirit and your word washing us from all of the bad news and all of our sin. We sense you filling us with your pure and loving Holy Spirit. And now we pray that you will allow the peace of Christ to rule in our hearts. We give ourselves to you to that end. In the beautiful name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand together and continue to worship him.
Well, Merry Christmas. I hope you'll all be with us uh, on, on Christmas Eve at 4 o'clock, either here in person or live streaming. We hope that you'll join us for that beautiful candlelight service, and we've got plenty of room here to stretch out. We've got overflow set up, so I hope that that'll be part of your Christmas tradition again this year as we're doing our best to uh, follow all of the guidelines and distance and mass, but at the same time, coming together to worship the Lord online. Thanks so much for being with us today, and I hope you'll stick around just for a couple minutes as Adam and Manda give you a, a few things you can do to respond to everything you've experienced today. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Have a great week.